Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this webinar is about the AVSS parachute systems for the Matrice 200 series. And I recognize a bunch of the names that are in the attendees uh, list of people who have purchased those from me. So this is good. And I've got a, a guest from AVSS who will talk about their systems and, and what they're all about. If you're kind of wondering why you're on this call, because you may want a parachute system for your M200 series. And there's some good reasons out there, especially in public safety, construction, and some other fields where you need to do those flights over people and you need some way of uh, getting a waiver for that. And this is gonna be a, a big piece here. So I do have a poll I'm gonna pop up real quick here on what, what do you use your your drone for you know what kind of category are you in this will give us um, a little bit of help on understanding who we're talking to and what your use case is so that should be uh, uh, helpful for us okay public safety and mapping and surveying are the biggies okay that's pretty much what I expected there's some inspection in, in there the majority being public safety and mapping all right good 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 all right i'll let a few more of you get your votes in there and uh go ahead and close that up that's pretty good all right and with me is josh ogden from avss uh some of you may have never heard of avss before they're not one of the the big names in parachute recovery systems yet but I have a feeling they're going to be. So Josh, welcome to the webinar. Yeah, thanks very much, Carrie, for having us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to chat and kind of discuss about parachute recovery systems and this um, growing niche in the drone market. All right, I'm just gonna get things going here and just hand the screen over to you and um, let you do your thing there, I think. Perfect. Uh, if I can... Uh... Where, where are you in here? Um, oh, here. Uh, let's see. Make presenter. There we go. Okay. And and can you just confirm that you see the screen? I do see the screen. Okay. It says a ninety-seven percent audience view. Okay. Perfect. Hundred percent. We're good to go. All right, so uh, hi everyone. My name is Josh Ogden. I'm one of the team members of AVSS, Aero Vehicle Safety Solutions. So we focus on building parachute recovery systems for commercial drones. Um, a bit about today in, in our company and kind of walking through what we'll be discussing. Um, so today we're going to just do a brief overview, but our company, as Carrie mentioned, we're probably not the most well known. Uh, we've been around since about 2017. We're based up in Canada and, um, you know, we've been kind of silently in development over the last three years and, and really bringing this first product to market specifically for the M200. Um, as well today, we're going to be talking about the value of parachutes um, as well as regulatory considerations over the last 18 months or so. In North America and Europe, you know, the regulatory environment has changed. And with COVID and how the current rules are ad adapting, I think we're going to see more and more use cases of parachutes and helping people kind of do those missions that previously were not accessible. And then we're going to talk about the use cases and, and where we're seeing customers who are buying our product and, and why they're buying it. You know, the parachute is not a product that um, everyone sees as value. There are certain use cases that that really can justify either the business case or the the investment from a, a public perception. And then we're going to talk about product features. I've got a short video kind of that I'll, I'll I'll play and talk over while we kind of explain the unique items to consider. Um, a lot of people when they see parachute recovery systems, I think it's just a parachute. And there's there's a little bit more more to it than meets the eye. And, and I think this is where we'll kind of talk about common misconceptions. And then at the end, we will open the floor to kind of discussions and questions. And I believe Carrie will be kind of monitoring the questions as they come in and we can kind of address those um, as we go. And so to talk about just about AVSS. So our company was founded in 2017. Um, our company started on the premise on 
you know, what happens when a drone fails. We were recognizing that these, you know, there, there's different use cases and drones were coming. However, there was rather limited regulatory environment to allow for, you know, whether it be flight over people or that burrito delivery that's obviously advertised a lot in the popular uh, media. And we also recognized that when we started the company, there were some countries already requiring the product, such as France and Chile. And, and for us, we looked at it a lot through the lens of, of seat belts and airbags. And, and we recognized that there were shortcomings in existing parachute solutions. And you know, there's, there's evolution similar to seat belts. Again, we really use that analogy not so much on saving the person in the car, but just on adding that additional safety feature and how the products evolved over time and gotten better. I think anyone who's been in the drone industry over the last three to five years has really seen the improvements, but also recognize that there's still a ways to go before we have that Jetson type lifestyle. And um, you know, we're all pretty much early adopters in this industry. And you know, there, there's gonna be, um, room for growth and improvement and we will see it and we are seeing it as the industry matures. And then, um, so right off the bat, kind of the value of parachutes. And when we look at a parachute recovery system, like the reality is you're adding a product to your drone that will reduce the flight time. You're adding a product that is intended to reduce the kinetic energy, therefore, save people and um, some people especially on the hobby level consumer side really get upset that the parachutes aren't guaranteeing that the drone will be saved um, and it's i think it's really important to understand where the value of the parachute is and what to expect you know it isn't a silver bullet that's going to protect your drone protect people and give you the waiver but there, there are key aspects to consider in understanding where you kind of fit within the drone market and how your commercial application would benefit from having a parachute recovery system and so kind of right off the bat, value of a parachute recovery system on the M200 series with or without a parachute. And I, th I think generally this slide is, it's to get the point across on, you know, if the drone falls from the sky, it's gonna create a certain amount of energy. And there's numerous studies that have shown there's a certain amount of energies, energy, kinetic energy referenced through jewels that will cause harm to a human being. And this is where civil aviation authorities have come in and said, okay, we need to reduce that. And a lot of uh, civil aviation authorities are looking at, um, you know, France was 69 joules, but it seems to be around less than 80 joules. And, you know, there's peer reviewed published studies that have shown that, you know, over 150 joules of energy, you're gonna cause um, traumatic brain injury. And this is where you add a parachute recovery system, assuming it's properly sized, for example, for the M200 around three meters squared, that it's, you know, being deployed at uh, around 100 meters, you're going to reduce it to approximately 65 joules to kind of give you an analogy that's you know a five pound brick being thrown at a car windshield at 17 miles an hour versus a five pound pound brick being thrown at a car at 72 miles and that's just to kind of give the insight on like the the brick's still coming you know you, you may break a leg of the drone when after the parachute deploys but ultimately you're safer so the civil aviation authorities like you as well as your drone's not a complete write-off um, and, and then kind of coming back to the global view and the, the view from, I think, the regulator lens on what we've dealt with with the drone industry. Um, I think a lot of countries are, are fearful of the big brother aspect, but even more so is, is the, the harm to bystanders. And so this is a very popular case that happened in 2015 in, I believe it was Switzerland. Uh, this was during a World Cup ski event, you know, so you're flying at higher altitude, it's cold weather. Um, that's going to affect the, the performance of the drone. And this actually resulted in them banning the use of camera drones. And that's that public acceptance piece on why, again, the value of parachutes and showing that you as an end user, whether it's public safety, construction, mapping, that you're doing all the steps to be prudent and make sure you're not harming others. Um, another example of kind of an unintended consequences of a drone crash was this was in Arizona in 2018. And this actually resulted in 300 acres being burnt down. Now this crash, you know, the LiPo battery resulted in a forest fire. And again, will the parachute guarantee that won't happen? No, but it's gonna improve your likelihood. And again, it's about that um, prudence and showing that you've gone through the extra steps, that you're, you've done the extra analysis, you understand the potential risk and you're reducing it. I think civil aviation recognizes you can't remove all risk, but you have to show 
proper steps to attempt to reduce risks. And then finally, um, talking about relevant drone crashes that we kind of show that this, this happened in 2017 in Japan. So this was a case where someone was using a drone, they were dispensing candy to kids and it came crashing down. And you know, people ended up in the hospital. And this is not gonna help with public acceptance. This is not gonna help you um, try to grow your drone program if these are the cases. And, and I am aware that after further analysis, the regulators were looking at this and this individual didn't have the right drone registered. I believe their license may have been expired. I'm not 100%, but I'm, I'm quite sure. And this is just an example of, you know, would a parachute guarantee that no single person would be hurt? No, because obviously they're flying below 100 meters or below 40 meters in the case for the M200. However, it's just those extra steps that need to be taken because I think anyone who's been in the drone industry long enough recognizes that, you know, they're man-made, there's gonna be errors, there's gonna be things that come out that, you know, you can't predict. And we would love a world where the drone doesn't crash and our product would be irrelevant. But I think we just have to come, come to terms with that's just not the reality we currently live in. And then finally, I think, and this is gonna segue into the regulatory discussion is, when we're looking at parachutes and the acceptance from the regulators view, um, there was a case last year with Matternet in Switzerland where they had um, a couple crashes and, and they needed to do um, work with the regulators on an analysis of what happened. And after the analysis, they, they made some safety recommendations with Matternet. It seemed was very proactive, implemented them. And you know, the, I believe they're back operating before COVID and, and they took the proper steps and that was included you know, improving their parachute recovery system and demonstrating through third-party testing that that it satisfied those third-party tests that really demonstrate that not only are you adding a parachute that should reduce the kinetic energy, but you're, you're not cheaping out, you're integrating a product that meets, you know, the industry-led standard that um, various stakeholders put a lot of time in over a couple of years to, to develop. And, you know, from our perspective, it is a pretty comprehensive testing mechanism in which you're working with an FAA test site uh, it's not cheap, you know, you're going through drones, you're completing over 45 flight tests and deployments, and you're showing the robustness of the system. And then this really segues into the regulatory environment with parachutes. Now, globally, there's different countries with different rules. Um, in North America, you know, Canada, USA, um, th these rules allowed for parachutes to enable more operations. Um, Chile and France had existing rules. And in Europe, it was supposed to be Q2, so I think it was July 1st, but now based on COVID, it seems it'll be delayed by six months. So I'm saying Q2, Q4, in which parachutes are going to enable more operations. And this is where um, people are wondering why. And again, this is the regulatory view from what, what we're seeing in the marketplace and what we're seeing. It's about reducing the risk of someone being hit by the drone. And this is the civil aviation authorities coming in and saying safety of bystanders is paramount. And this is where they viewed and they developed um, a source of specific operational risk assessment. And when completing these risk assessments, it, it's basically a point system. And if you exceed seven points, your system isn't supported through the SORA and so your, your operation. And so by adding a parachute, specifically in Europe, you're going to be able to reduce your points, either one or two points, depending on the parachute system, the data and the third party testing. So there's going to be missions that previously otherwise were not acceptable that are now acceptable. And again, this is just an example in Europe. And then I, I do recognize that probably the bulk of the people on this uh, webinar today are probably from North America, US. And this is where it's also relevant in the US. Um, and, and this just happened over the last year. So up until September 2018, there, this standard wasn't published and it was finally kind of accepted. It had gone through the different iterations and it became pub, uh, public. And then over the last year, there's been a few companies that have completed it on uh, smaller drones on DJI. And um, this is where we, we saw some announcements on that. You know, the FAA has pretty much shown that it's not a rubber stamp per se, because you still have to show that You've got the proper training, the license, and, and, and the, the risk assessments, but it's pretty much showing that there's a repeatable process for the drone and parachute combination. And we think the data is really showing that as well. So since 2016, up until the end of 2019, there was rather minimal um, 
approval for flight over people. However, in 2019, we're starting to really see that growth in approvals and it really happened in Q3, Q4. And when we dig further into the numbers and we see like what's going on, you know, there are the few companies that have gotten the approval without the parachute recovery system, for example, um, Google's wing. And, and you know, those, those companies have substantial budget to go through these additional documentation, testing and reporting. But one thing that we've seen in the market is, is the parachute recovery system drone combination being enabling for the construction, the public safety, the drone service providers to receive those waivers. And I think the data is showing, and, and we would argue that the parachute recovery system is a path for compliance and a path for you to meet the requirements of the FAA and get that approval to fly over people and complete your mission. And, and this is where we, we're seeing really relevant use cases specific to the parachute. Yep. Uh, I got a question here. Is the ASTM F3322 standard actually approved by the FAA now? So no, so the, the way it's working is it's showing compliance. So what it is, is it's similar with the FAA in Transport Canada is that when you pass the third party testing as a parachute vendor, and then you provide the data sets and the product to your customer, then they apply for the waiver. And that is supposed to be the, okay, the FAA is recognizing that standard as relevant to do this mission. They don't specifically say, I approve of ASTM F3322. If you have that, you're good to go. Um, but it's showing that they're recognizing it. And this is where um, someone will, for example, in Canada might say they're Transport Canada um, approved, where it's no, 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 you're compliant with the standards that they have developed. They don't actually go and approve of a specific standard is from what we're gathering right now from the regulators. Great, JD, did that answer your question? Okay, I think we're good, thanks. Perfect, clear as mud? With the FAA, always. <laughs> exactly, and this is where, again, I think I think the wording and how you describe, uh, spe specifically parachute recovery systems because they're opening up some market segments that weren't previously able to kind of address is that the wording of it is, is so finicky and it's evolving as well. Um, so, you know, Ultimately, I think it's understanding that, okay, there's a path um, and the regulators are recognizing that this standard has, has, has some merit. And this is where we're going into some of the use cases. Now, I think it's important to recognize that the parachute recovery system is not for every customer. Um, you know, there's certain use cases where the, you know, payload combination may result in exceeding the max takeoff weight. So that's not, that's, that doesn't help. Um, there's use cases where you're flying at an altitude that, um, you know, maybe you're flying at 50 feet where the parachute recovery system isn't going to operate regardless if it meets the standard and, and, and has that robustness. Um, and so it's important to understand where this could add value. And I think this is really important to kind of get across on, on who's going to really derive value from the product. Um, and first off, we, we're seeing a lot of value and a lot of interest from the construction industry. For example, we have a customer that, that has pre-ordered the product right now, and their mission is including flying over uh, an area in Canada in which without the parachute recovery system, they'd have to shut down this entire site. It's a tourist area, and they're, they've been tasked with um, doing a, a rehabilitation over a certain amount of years. And for them, they did the business case on, okay, if we're gonna go and collect that data and provide reporting to our customer over these few years, well, it's going to cost a lot more than if we can just use the drone, have the, the safety device and be approved. And this is where I think from a construction perspective an engineering perspective is, you, it's the business case on, okay, what would happen and what would be the tasks involved in you roping off the entire construction site? Um, how, how much control mechanisms are you gonna have to ensure no bystanders are entering this work site? And then it's, it's really a strong business case in that regard. Um, and then the next one that we're really seeing is public safety. Now, public safety is, is as much as it's about, you know, being able to fly missions over people. It's not so much the cost savings as much as it's the public perception, as well as the future costs that could occur if a crash. I think public safety generally gets a bad rap if 
the general public do not understand why they're using the drone as a force multiplier, why they're using it really to provide a better service to their citizens. And one thing we see is um, public safety officials don't want to spend time having to educate the public and journalists on not only about their drone program, about why a drone crashed. You know, there's a case in Canada a couple of years ago where, you know, an expensive, you know, $100,000 plus drone kind of disappeared because of a flyaway and the amount of press and the amount of time, you know, there's cost to that, but just the general public acceptance and trust. And I think we've seen that with a few cases with COVID on drones being used in a way in which they, the intentions were noble, the intentions were good. However, the perception after that press release or that media spin was negative. And this is where we see public safety having the drone, using it good, and they having those extra steps just to show that they really care and they're taking those extra steps to get that public acceptance. Um, that's something that we're seeing really with public safety on why they're interested in parachute recovery systems and on how they're basically assessing the investment into the product. Um, and so those are the really two big use cases that we wanted to focus on because that's what we're seeing. You know, there's some companies that will push for, you know, drone service providers to get the waiver because they justify that they can make more money. We've, we've seen a few of those cases. And like, if you look at the waivers, there's been a lot of waivers for drone service providers, but we haven't seen the hard calculations yet on, hey, with the parachute, I can charge X amount of more dollars. I haven't seen those calculations, so I'm not prepared to make that statement. But we are also aware that, you know, a lot of the existing waivers are for drone service providers. And so I think over the next year or so, we're going to see more of that data on a on, uh, drone service provider with or without a parachute and how they're able to generate revenue. And, and we're hoping to be able to provide some use cases on that. Um, and then finally, kind of uh, going into product features. So when you're looking at parachute recovery systems, it's more than a parachute. So the parachute is the piece that I think when people hear, they understand, they've seen for decades, and that's where a lot of the misconceptions come in. And when you look at the parachute recovery system for existing drone models, um, you know, they're not integrated in. There's a few companies across the world that have, have actually integrated similar to, you know, that airbag or seatbelt into a car, but we're still not at a place where they've been fully integrated into the drone as that OEM solution. And so when you're looking at a parachute recovery system, there's certain features that are required for the system to work, but then there's certain features for the third party testing. And then there's certain features to make your end users life easier. And one thing that we've spent a lot of time on and we've focused on is making sure that it's a simple to use plug and play integration. And we felt that when you're looking at parachute recovery systems, you know, a police officer who, who also operates a drone is a police officer first, the drone pilot second, Maybe they're not an engineer, maybe they don't have the most technical background and they don't want to spend time, you know, soldering wires, playing with PCBs, dealing with different integrations. And that's where we really focused on saying, how do you make it so, you know, they open it out of the box, they integrate it in less than 20 minutes the first time and future integrations are less than 60 seconds. And that's where we've really focused on the plug and play features that we'll show in the video as well. One thing that with the third party standard that's specific to flight over people waivers is the end user is actually not allowed to repack a parachute. So there are some parachute systems, a lot of the spring solutions that after deployment you can repack. However, the end user with this third party standard is actually not allowed to repack it. And this creates a new host of issues as far as workflow disruption and just time. And this is where we've actually come in and, and we feel that a part of our innovation with our product is that the end user doesn't have to repack it. And the way we've done it is we've actually separated the product in two modules and allow it. So when someone buys our product, you're actually getting two parachute pods. And, and after deployment, they have a backup. So they don't have to worry, you know, the drone's good. They do their inspection and, you know, they got to go back the next day. And, you know, the drone has met their worthiness. Well, they've got their parachute system. So they're still compliant because we've separated the piece and we've allowed it so that if they ship back the old one, there's a credit as well as um, they can purchase additional parachute pods. And then additionally with product features, um, you need to make sure that the system can detect a failure autonomously as well as you have a manual remote. Um, the human reaction speed using the manual remote is not 
ever going to be faster than the autonomous. However, maybe you're in a situation which you're flying and, and you're not feeling comfortable and you're getting some poor data link and, and you decide, you know what, it's just better for me to control this right now and I'm gonna use the manual route. And that's where that's coming in as well as it's a requirement. And then finally, another item that really understand what the product features is, you, you've integrated the system, it's really easy to use, you know if it deploys, you, you can go back the next day assuming the drone is in a good status. You know that the system's gonna autonomously deploy or manually deploy. But one thing that you have to make sure as well is that there's a flight termination system. Again, a lot of, a lot of the existing solutions do lack that flight termination system. And what the purpose of that is, is one, to avoid entanglement so that the propellers don't get entangled, as well as to avoid laceration. So when the parachute or the drone comes down and it's able to land on someone, that it's not gonna cut them up. And so there's this sequence of event that detect failure, cut power to the drone to stop the props from spinning, deploy the parachute, and then replace the parachute. So there's all these product features that you have to be aware of. And this is where not all parachute recovery systems are the same because you know from the M200, you're dealing with a closed system. And you know, we've spent a lot of time just figuring out how, how are we gonna cut off the power, the power to the drone without opening up the main enclosure? Because if you open up the main enclosure, you're affecting the ingress protection as well as you're causing an extra step for the technician or where you're buying it from to, to have to do. And then this is where we'll kind of show a video of the actual product. So what we're going to see here, uh, assuming this pops up, uh, Terry, can you confirm that you can see the video? Good. Good. All right. So I'll just kind of talk over it is right here in this video, this was earlier this year, us just doing a ground test and replacement. And so this is our product on the M200, the, the pod here, this is a, a black pod that we have for some customers. And so this is gonna show the ground test as well as the flight termination system. So our system, you know, real simple to use. You press one button, you turn on the drone, you're good to go. There's communication between the drone and the remote to confirming that the power is on, that everything's good to go. And in this situation, what we'll do is we'll spin up the power to the props and we'll just do a ground deployment with the manual remote. And what, what you'll see here is um, the timing of it is that you're gonna have the flight termination system react as well as the parachute deploy. And this is going to just show you just, you know, a simple ground deployment on, on what you're looking at. And with our product as well, we do use a spring-based um, solution. So ballistic solutions include CO2, pyrotechnic, and um, spring base. And this is where we really focused on and, and kind of our conversations with Carry on our product is the parachute's deployed, you remove the parachute off the main line, and then you gotta replace it. So again, assuming your drone is still airworthy, you're good to go. This is where we feel that our product is really gonna help the end user out is it's a simple M6 pull, grab a hex key, and you're good to go. We also have included with our product some communication between the systems confirm that it's properly aligned, that there's no issues. And you'll see here, uh, my colleague turn on the power of the system and the lighting's a bit poor, but there's a green light there kind of explaining that, you know, hey, everything's connected, you're good to go, you're ready to fly. And then kind of skipping through this just a little bit, what we have here is the drone in the sky. And basically in this part right now is we're gonna be showing a manual deployment as well as showing how the auto trigger is able to detect that the drone hasn't exceeded its limits, that there's no false positives. So if that gust of wind comes in, you know your parachute's just not gonna deploy because that's not a failure. And our system has been developed so there's soft and hard um, parameters so that we know that the drone is operating within its flight envelope and that it's good to go. And in this case, a manual deployment um, showing that the drone is descending less than five meters per second, and that's gonna come down and what we'll also be showing here is that, you know, the, the drone's going to land, it's going to flip upside down, and we're going to speed up here and come up to the drone showing that there's no damage. Now, that can't be guaranteed every time. You know, if you have um, some legs that are maybe older or you land on concrete, you know, those legs may break. But with the big picture from a regulatory side is, you know, the amount of kinetic energy is reduced. And from the... Um, the drone uh, side, the legs may break, but $130 fix is a lot cheaper than completely having to write off your drone. 
And as you can see in this video, in this case, on landing on some snow, that you know there is no damage and that drone's good to go back up in the air. Josh, I do want to reiterate that point. And you said it earlier and you just said it again, but I, I want people to, to really hammer home the point. Parachute systems are not designed to protect your aircraft at all costs and eliminate damage to the aircraft. Correct. You know, and, and, they, they will probably protect your payload, but they're to protect the people on the ground. Exactly. And, and that's something that I think it's really important to recognize. And I think there's some people that will look at the price and still kind of balk at it and say, you know, that's still an expensive product. Um, I guess my argument usually comes down to, you know, it's it's meeting the safety requirements of regulators, meeting the third party testing, which is not cheap at all. You know, this is it's quite an investment to get to this stage and the drone industry where it's at and how it's kind of a new product coming. Prices will eventually probably go down a bit, but the cost to develop one of these solutions is is not it's not cheap. I can definitely say that it, it definitely requires investment to get to that stage and to get to that robustness. And that's where, again, that third party standard being recognized by civil aviation authorities to helping save lives is, is where we're kind of at as an industry. And this is where kind of coming into common misconceptions is, is really important to understand. And, and this is going into first off parachute recovery systems. Right now on the market, there's, I believe there's about 12 or 13 different solutions you can look at um, for the M200. Now they all don't have uh, flight termination systems. They might not have an autonomous trigger as well. They might not meet this third party standard. And then finally, you know, the actual integration process might require you to open up the main enclosure and, and plug in a PCB and, and, you know, deal with those wires and integration. Um, and so when you're looking at parachute recovery systems, pricing is obviously important. You don't want to spend the same price as a parachute as the drone, but you need to understand what you're actually getting and what that's going to do to your operations as far as flight time integration and whether those features and testing have been completed so that you can do and apply for those waivers. Um, the next one is the misconception and again this goes back to Carrie's point is that parachute will save my drone. Unfortunately I wish I wish I could say that is guaranteed but that's not. You know we do testing quite often and um, I can tell you we're not, we're not crushing through M200 legs very often but it does happen. And, and, you know, if you're landing on concrete versus snow versus grass, um, it will have different effects. And, and I think when you're looking at parachute recovery systems, it's important to see those videos from different um, solution providers. And, and, you know, when you're watching videos, make sure you see if the video is really showing the drone landing, because that's important to see on, on the transparency of, of what will happen and making sure that that marketing communication is honest and, and, and accurate. And then the next one is about parachute recovery systems. And, and this is specific to the US. So in Canada, we have a bit of different rules with compliant drone operators, with compliant um, drones and advanced licensing. But in the US, you still have the waiver process. So the way it would work is you buy your system, you get the data sheets, you have it, you show your plan and you submit to the FAA. And there's a, you know, there's a lag time. And that's just the process. And like, from what I understand in, in, in conversations I've had, it's like, you know, not everyone's gonna get a slam dunk right away and there's some back and forth. So we wanna make sure that people understand there are a few steps to take. And there are some providers out there that do support um, independent, like your third party assistance with waivers. I believe uh, there's one company called uh, 107waivers.com. They provide assistance with companies looking at applying for the waivers and going going through that process. And that's just something that's unique to the US at this point. Um, and then finally, one thing that has updated recently is historically, if you added a parachute recovery system and the drone had a malfunction, for example, with the M200, there were some issues with firmware updates a couple of years ago in the UK, as well as some um, issues with the IP rating and misunderstandings and negative effects to the ESCs and causing random failures. And historically, DJI was taking the position of um, that if you add a third party system, you're voiding the warranty. Now, um, I think it's a good sign as the industry acknowledges the relevancy of parachutes and the importance of providing warranty for their for their products as DJI has 
updated their their policy. Now I've been told that this policy isn't publicly um, available yet on their website, but this is recent where they've updated their new after sales policy regarding parachutes. And this is a direct quote from a DJI contact um, that wanted me to quote the DJI after sales policy. And basically, if you're within existing warranty and the drone fails, not because of the parachute, but maybe because of an issue, maybe you get a bad motor um, on your drone, well, they'll still uh, service that. So that's a really good sign that, you know, if you're buying your system and the system fails, because of the actual drone and not the parachute, you'll still be covered. Um, and you know you do have to be aware that's based on their data analysis. Um, and I can't really speak to how that actually works. And I'm sure Kerry can touch on that as he'd have more experience. Um, but you know, it, to me, this is a good sign showing that the industry is collaborating together, we're working together. We understand that as manufacturers, we have to support the pilots and we have to make sure that the products we build um, not only meet regulatory requirements, but aren't too burdensome in events of issues that arise in the future. And I guess, Carrie, any, any comments on that point on, on what you've seen as far as, um, you know, malfunctioning of, of drones and, and that process? They've been, they've been pretty good uh, more recently about that. If they're, they're looking at the actual logs, they're looking at the, the aircraft itself and not really having an issue with any third party products unless it was that thing that caused the problem. And of course that's not gonna be covered, but if their logs and their analysis show that that was not part of the issue, then there hasn't been any problem. Okay, wonderful, perfect. And then, um, yeah, and then kind of coming into our product and this is where I can, I'll do our sales pitch on our product. So right now we're in the pre-order stage. Um, delivery is expected by the end of June now with COVID. I say that with, with an asterisk. Right now we haven't had any updates from our any of our supply chain vendors for us to think otherwise. However, I think it's very pragmatic to assume that there could be potential delays um just based on border status or items that come up that we're not aware of um and so right now i would say delivery late june early july for sure and when you're looking at the product um and carries extending this is is you're not having to pay for it all up front you're going to do a 250 refundable deposit and with that deposit um you kind of put your put yourself in line and then you know maybe maybe the timeline doesn't uh, a lineup. I know I have a couple customers that have said, hey, I've got a mission, but if I don't get it by this date, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to move forward. And, you know, we're okay with that. And I assume Carrie's going to offer that extension um, that, you know, if you buy the product and it doesn't line with your schedule, there'd be that 250 deposit is refunded. And then before the product ship, you know, we'll square up on the existing outstanding balance. Um, and with our product, one thing to, to, to recognize is it does come with two parachute pods. So when you're looking at our solution, you're getting two deployments versus one, as well as with our product, you're gonna get the, all the you know, electronic module, the flight termination system, which is the yellow pieces around the battery. You're gonna get the bracket, as well as you're gonna get an independent remote that's synced, that's a custom remote that we've developed, as well as you'll have a backup battery so that you, know, you don't have to worry about um, the, the parachute recovery system battery dying before you know, all your missions are done for the day. And then finally, there's a one-year warranty, three deployments, so that if you do deploy a parachute, you need to buy a replacement pod, that you, you still are covered underneath that warranty, and then you'll have your documentation so for you to apply for your Part 107 waiver. So a couple things I, I want to point out um, on this particular slide here for uh, all the guys out there that I've talked to before, and we've, we've talked about some other parachute systems. The fact that this comes with two parachute pods to me is a biggie with the other systems that I've looked at and I had talks with if that parachute deployed and you had to now send that system back to the manufacturer and get it repacked and if you were relying on that parachute to be on your system to do your mission you could be down for a week two weeks maybe even three weeks and here Boom, you, you put the other pod on and you are back in business immediately while we're getting you that another replacement pod. So that I think is really cool. And the integration that they've done 
on the batteries, I think is phenomenal versus some of the other systems, which were just weird, clunky, uh, mechanical systems on the back that would literally eject the batteries to shut it down. This is fully integrated, takes up virtually no additional space. Those battery adapters, you can leave on the aircraft when it's in its case, everything, and just pop your batteries in and you're ready to go. So I think from an integration point of view and that um, having two pods handy at all times, that's why I'm really excited about this particular platform versus some of the other ones that uh, we've looked at and you know we've had talks with and we've all seen at trade shows. I really think this is the slickest, cleanest system out there and you're not down waiting for a repack. So I think those are really huge points. Thank you very much, Gary. Yeah, and, and I think that like every time I hear those type of comments, it especially someone who's been in the industry, as long as you have carried, like, I always like to share that with our engineers because, you know, I'm, I'm more on the business side of things, dealing with dealers, talking, looking at regulations. And, you know, sometimes I sit here and think, you know, what are those damn engineers doing? Why are they spending so much time working on something? But you know what? I think when you see the output and that ease of use, it's, it's, uh, it's worth the gray hair. I, I don't think there's any doubt there. Uh, this is still the infancy of this type of market. And I'm sure we'll see more innovation down the road and everything. But right now, the seeing it like this is really sweet. Um, okay, JD's asking, um, in this picture, you have TB50s on here, but the uh, Matrice 200 Series V2 works with TB55s. Is that an issue? No, so uh, and I can provide that um, photo. Is we we we've done testing on the fifty five, so that's not an issue. Okay, and uh, there was a question: Do you make parachute systems for other DJI products yet, such as the M six hundred Pro? Uh, we do not make uh, the product for the M six hundred Pro. Our next product that we're focusing on one is the Sky Ranger. It's on our website. Um, as far as the M600, it's not something, so like when we look at the DJI market, we spend a lot of time talking to dealers and it's not something that we've had as a priority. Um, you know, the, if a customer came in and there was a justification for a certain amount of units, we'd always look at a product, but at this point, no, there, there is no product in the roadmap directly for the M600. Yeah. I mean, I sell maybe one a month at this point. So, and it's only come up maybe once or twice where people have asked for it but on the m200 series i mean this comes up on a daily basis so uh i think it's it's okay there's other systems out there already for the m600 i mean par zero makes one um and it's it's a pretty neat system but um i think when we're we're talking about the prior the, the core product today which being the m200 series uh, this is definitely you know, I think going to be my go-to product here. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's it for questions right now so far. Yeah. And I can just touch on that M600 one. Just one more is from what I understand. And again, this industry moves real quick. There is one company out of Austria called Drone Rescue that has a solution for the M600. However, I'm not sure if it's blanketed for all M600s. Um, if you just Google Drone and Rescue Austria, I think they, they would be able to maybe provide some more input on that product. Okay. Wonderful. So- um, You got anything else? No, I think that's it. If you have any questions, obviously you can contact Carrie directly and Carrie can filter them to us. As well, you can check out our website, um, or if you want to see the product and video, you can just, uh, if you just Google uh, DJI M200 Parachute, you'll see our, our first phase of testing from ASTM. Um, and you'll be able to kind of, yeah, just Google, I think you have to put ABSS in, and yeah, uh, videos. Yeah, you'll be able to kind of go and check it out. Some of the dealers have it on their website as well as you'll be able to check out if you want to see the product in action and, and us using, um, considering you're in Colorado, you, I assume, have the respect for the Canadian weather and, and you can see some video of us testing in some uh, unfortunate weather conditions and the product working. What about altitude? 
I mean, because we are uh, the you know the lowest here in Colorado is uh, almost a mile above sea level, and then a lot of the search and rescue teams and stuff are operating at eight, ten, eleven thousand feet. So the way in which our auto trigger is calibrated is that um, you, you can calibrate it from you know your initial standpoint, and the auto trigger doesn't actually initiate until you hit 15 meters from that initial um, launch point. Well, how does that have an effect on the descent speed? The altitude? Yeah, the air density. Uh, you know what? I've got to follow up with that. I can't, I do not know off the top of my head and let me follow up with that one with the guys. Um, I'm just trying to think of our testing environments and if that has come up, uh, I don't, have a hundred percent response. So I'm, I'm going to have to follow up on that one, Carrie. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, we'll definitely try and find that answer for you uh, as soon as we can. And, um, if you get back over here. All right, guys. Well, uh, that was, Josh, and I think we covered all our Q&A stuff, unless anyone else has any other questions. Uh, if you are interested in this, you know, definitely feel free, reach out to me, and we'll get you on, you know, the list. Uh, I'll get to be getting some more information up online here pretty soon about it. Um, but I'm very curious if you guys are interested in this product. Um, I know I am. And uh, I know a lot, I'm looking at the names of the attendees in here, and it's, there's a lot of people that I've talked to about parachutes in the, the past and even recently. So it, if you're interested in this, shoot me an email, kgarrison at multicopterwarehouse.com. We do have weekly webinars at uh, multicopterwarehouse.com slash events. We have uh, next week, we're talking with Blue Vigil and their tether systems, which I think is going to be pretty interesting. And the following week, I don't have this one online yet, but I should have it there tomorrow. We've got the guys from remotepilot101.com coming on to talk about getting your part 107 if you haven't already got that and how they can uh, help you get through that. It's the program that I use. It's the program that all my employees use, and we recommend them highly. So uh, if you're still looking to get your part 107, join us in two weeks with Remote Pilot 101. So Josh, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate the info. I'm, I'm very excited about the product. It, if it wasn't for this, we'll call it a world situation right now, uh, it would be coming a little sooner, but uh, is, is what it is. I love that integration. I love the cleanness of it. I love that it comes with two parachute pods so people aren't down for weeks at a time if they have a problem. So really appreciate you taking the time and joining us today. Yes, thank you very much, Carrie, for having us. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to let us chat with your team. And um, we're also always interested in hearing feedback. If you've got anyone who's been on the webinar who wants to provide feedback, love to hear it. Um, we always just want to improve the product and, and give you guys the best solution available. Um, okay, here is a question. Uh, working in public safety, we typically fly our M210 with a Z30 and an XT2, that's already a lot of weight. Does the parachute add too much weight to that system? And is what kind of effect on performance would that have? Yes, and I've got that, give, give me one second. I'm gonna pull, so we, we've looked at the payload configurations. Um, and Do you have so- have a, a screen for that that I should pop over, make over, uh, should I put your screen back on? Uh, just one sec. Let me see if I can find it quick enough to justify. Give me that. I'm, I'm probably going to follow up with an email because I want to confirm some numbers um, on DJI's website. The last time we looked, so you said the Z30 and XTS, correct? XT2. XT2. Yeah. So when you look at, is it the M210 V1 or V2? Um, Jason, what are you running? A V1. Okay, and are you using TB50 or TB55s? Fifty-fives. Okay, so if you're using fifty-fives, you would exceed the maximum takeoff weight. So it's uh, but if you're using TB50s on the V1, you would be underneath the six point one four. So that would be battery dependent. 
Um, and so obviously for the B2, you would exceed that maximum takeoff weight when you add those two payloads at once. And then regarding your, your, your reduction in flight time, what we're seeing is about eight to 10% in, in reduction in flight time when we're doing hover tests. Now hover tests are a bit harder on the drone, but that gives you kind of an approximate um, because obviously if it's cold weather, if it's windy, there's, there's other variables to give you an exact number. Okay, good deal. All right, well, thanks so much. Um, again, um, thanks everybody. If you have questions about the products, uh, let me, um, well, I'll be sending out an email uh, with a recording of this for everybody, as well as uh, Josh's contact info and my contact info. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to either one of us. If you want to go ahead and get on that list to get started with, you know, or get reserved, feel free to, to hit me up and I will get you guys on the list. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you spending a little time with us this afternoon. And hopefully we'll see you again next week.